Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, sorry if it looks a little bit weird. I, if I put it on, it feels like I'm playing a video game, like Counter-Strike or something. So, and then I'll, it also feels like I'm a Backstreet Boy if I put it up there. And so I'm putting it down here. Um, okay, cool. All right, cool. Thanks for, thanks for having me here, guys. Um, I've been at Coast for about 10 years now, um, 10 years is December. And um, I'm excited to be here with you guys. So in last week's sermon, Mary Ann showed us that when we face circumstances that are against all odds, having faith in God changes everything. I'm going to tell you a story before we dive in. So we're going to keep looking at the letter of Paul to the Romans. But I want to tell you a story when I was five years old when I almost killed a few of my family members. Even Sterling, my wife, did not know about this story. So when I was five years old, it was a Sunday afternoon, we were getting ready for church. My parents were running around the house, doing some errands, getting everything ready before we left. My brother and sister happened to be outside just playing in the yard, and silly old me being the middle child, just exploring the house and trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. Lo and behold, I walk into the garage, and I see my dad's Buick with the door open, the keys and the ignition, and the car being on. So I hop in the car, and of course I'm imitating my mom and dad when it comes to how do you drive a car. Uh, and as I'm in the car, the ignition is on. I somehow remember that, yes, you always, I always see my dad putting his foot on the brake and then shifting the gear. So I reach down, I'm not obviously not as tall as I am now, but like, you know, I reach down with my foot, press the brake, and I actually, I actually shift into reverse. And then the next thing I remember my dad doing every time he would drive a car is to hit the accelerator pedal. And that's exactly what I did. And in that moment, I just remember hearing my dad screaming, no, like just yelling and freaking out. And before we knew it, in a split second, my other foot was on the accelerator and I started going backwards from the garage out into the front yard. And apparently, according to my dad, I almost run over my brother, but he was able to dodge. But my dad was able to grab my sister and jump out of the way like one of those action movies. But I managed to actually run over his toe. Yeah, yeah, and the car apparently keeps going. And I also remember being a five-year-old kid, oh yeah, I think you're supposed to turn the wheel. So I turned the wheel, apparently I turned the wheel, and the car just swerves and hits three cars in the neighborhood before it comes to a complete stop. And my next memory from that was later that evening, all of my relatives were in the living room and I'm just sitting there twiddling my thumbs and I'm like, what happened? What's going on? You know, you just don't remember that much when you're a five-year-old kid because there's so much just um, intensity with that kind of moment. And, um, and uh, you know, it was funny because my curiosity led to a potentially tragic mistake and it obviously had consequences, right? Damaged vehicles, a total Buick, my parents' car, angry parents, a smashed toe, and a five-year-old David still wondering when he gets to have his next joy ride. Um, so my actions as a five-year-old kid had some big consequences and affected people around me. And today we're going to talk about sin, because sin also has consequences. Sin has consequences, and, when, and we can respond to sin with both grace and justice. Sometimes we value one more than the other. Today we're focusing on grace. Understanding sin helps us understand our relationship with God and what God may be doing in you and around you. Now sin is a, an extremely loaded Christianese word. When you hear it at church or you mention it in front of your friends who might not be followers of Jesus, it makes all of us uncomfortable. But we actually talk about sin and see its effects every single day. In the news, we see stories of misogyny, of racism, of Twitter wars. We see sin play out in the unfettered arguments with our spouses, with our friends, with traffic on the way home from work, and even with our own kids. We see our global environment plagued by unhealthy economic decisions, where our world is being destroyed day by day. We see sin in ourselves, and we see sin in our churches. And all of this begs a key question that we're going to explore today. 
how does God respond to sin and its consequences? It's an uncomfortable topic. How does God respond to sin and its consequences? So we're going to look at chapter 5, the letter of Paul to the Romans. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's keep reading. Since we have now been justified by his blood, by Jesus' blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And you're going to, by the way, I'm going to pause real quick. You're going to see the system of logic that Paul uses a lot, that if God's already done X, Y, Z, then how much more will he ABC? If God's already sacrificed his own son, he, he himself manifested in the flesh as Jesus, to die for us, how much more is he going to want to spend the rest of eternity, every single waking moment and sleeping moment, loving us and taking care of us? Or if you've already booked that round trip ticket to go see and spend time with your friend all across the world, I mean, how much more when you're there are you going to want to maximize time with them, take photos with them, explore the city with them? So that's what's God saying here. So let's keep reading. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, you hear that again, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I know it's a loaded passage. There's a lot of theology here. So how does God respond to sin and its consequences? The first insight we have here you can find in your bulletin is this. God is loving us in our sin Write it down. God is loving us in our sin, even when we cannot comprehend or receive his love. That is hard to do. Imagine loving your spouse or your friend or your kids when they are actively disobeying you or not listening to you or exercising empathy. Paul answers this question of how does God respond to sin by inserting a provocative truth. God loves us in our sin. God loves us at our worst and through our worst moments. Yes, even when we are particularly unlovable. When you are powerless, helpless, and lost in sin, God still loves you. Wow. It sounds easy to believe, right? No. The Gospels are filled with stories of Jesus engaging and offering his presence to sinners. You have the Zacchaeuses, you have the Judases, you have the adulterous woman, you have the prostitutes, and even the thieves on the cross with whom he ultimately died. Yet in those stories, you see a stark contrast between Jesus and the religious elite. While Jesus chose love, the religious elite chose condemnation. For the religious elite, it was far easier and maybe even convenient and habitual to elect punitive measures than to love others in their sin. Why? Because that was the law. Our own responses to sin can be punitive in nature. Instead of one being filled with grace... See, Paul here, guys, he's proclaiming that Jesus loves us despite our sins and in our sins. And that's important to know. God doesn't love us when we're, when we're ready to apologize, because that's easy. God loves us in our sin, and there's forgiveness. So church, here's a question for you. Where in your life do you need God to say, I love you and I'm with you in your darkest moments? And as many of you know, as a church, we're still going through a lot of transition, growth, and change. Where do you see God? Where do you hear his voice speaking to us as he walks us in in some of the darkest seasons of our lives? 
Let's keep reading. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. So Paul's kind of kicking off uh, this discourse, and then he pauses. That little dash you see, he actually pauses and realizes, oh, I need to explain something about the law before I keep going with my argument. So that's what's happening here. And then he pauses and he goes, you know what, I'm going to talk about the law. So he goes, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. There's a lot of words here, and Paul's going through some weird arguments right here, but you know what Paul is ultimately saying here? It's this. Sin is deadly, destructive, and far-reaching. Sin is deadly, destructive, and far-reaching. As humanity, we're all connected to Adam, to Moses, to Jesus, to each other. And since the time of Adam, sin, death, and resurrection have ruled across all humanity. So as a response, what Paul is saying here is God gave the Israelites the Mosaic Law, a list of things that you should live by. But even when the law entered the equation, the law exacerbated and magnified the effects of sin. In other words, the law was not an effective response to addressing sin. The law actually made things worse. I've worked with a lot of sex addicts over the past 10 years as I've worked through my own sex addiction. And I can't tell you how many new guys that I meet that come in and say, I'm gonna gonna figure out the sex addiction. I'm gonna figure out my addiction to pornography. I'm gonna figure out my addiction to prostitutes. I'm gonna figure this all out. And this white knuckle through it all. And they're good for a month. They They go through groups for like a month and they just disappear. And I always talk to my sponsors, my friends, um, who help lead the group with me. And we always go, yep, that person doesn't come back in about a couple months. Just wait. And they always do. Because you cannot white-knuckle your way through something by living by tyranny of shoulds. Well, I should do this, or I should do that. Or, yeah, this is the right thing to do, so I'm going to keep doing this, I'm going to keep doing this. Because the shoulds don't change you. The law doesn't change you. And I want to offer another comment on sin. I think our Western culture individualizes sin. What I mean by that is this. Our Western culture or evangelical Christianity removes corporate culpability because Western Christianity prefers compartmentalizing our spiritual experience to strictly between me and God. So, hey, if I'm good with God, when you say that sinner's prayer, that's between you and God. So if you guys are good, that's good. Your relationship with God, that's all that matters. And I think there's such an individualization of sin when it comes to Western evangelical Christianity that's dangerous. But what Paul is saying here, and this is important, church, what Paul is saying here is that sin has a communal impact. Sin is never individualized. You see this impact play out in systemic racism. You see this impact play out in the hidden culture of sex abuse in the Catholic Church. You see this communal impact of sin play out in the prevalent self-righteousness that plagues the political spectrum and discourses, right? There is a communal impact to sin. When one person might struggle with self-righteousness, that can be contagious. Because if they're right and I, I like them as a person, oh, I'm on the side with them. And that happens so much. And it leads to this communal, deadly impact. Sin is deadly, destructive, and far-reaching. Now let's keep reading what Paul has to say to that. Paul goes on, But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, which is Adam, How much more, see that logic again, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, right? All of humanity, that sin, that death, that destruction. But then how much more? 
not Adam, but Jesus, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign through Jesus? You know what Paul's saying here, guys? Paul's saying that the cosmic actions of Adam have universal implications for humanity. But, but, so do the actions of Jesus. Where death and condemnation came through Adam, life and grace came through Jesus Christ. To simplify Paul's discourse here, the gift is not like the trespass because it's far, far greater. I think, when we, I think as a church, when we look at grace, we think it's one-to-one. -one. Hey, where there's sin, there's grace. Where there's sin, there's grace. Where there's sin, there's grace. Anytime grace is mentioned, you wonder, well, what the heck was a sin? Right, as if grace existed, as if grace exists only because sin exists. And Paul is saying something different here. When God responds to sin and its consequences, he starts with forgiveness to defeat that sin, but there's so, so much more. Church, listen. Listen to this. God's gift of grace is not one dimensional. And I think when we think of grace, we're like, well, grace means forgiveness. Grace equals forgiveness because it addresses sin. But Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Forgiveness is one piece of grace. There's actually a lot more to grace than that. It doesn't just focus on sin or on bringing things back to the way it used to be. So here's a couple of insights. With Jesus, God is not interested in reversing history to pre-sin. How often do we hear, make America great again? How often do we hear, can we just go back to things the way they used to be in our marriages, with our finances, with our jobs, with our relationships, with our church? Can we just go back to the way it used to be pre-sin? And a lot of us think that's forgiveness. But God is saying, no, that, no, no, no. Yes, there's forgiveness, but grace is so much more. Instead, God's in the business of creating something entirely new with your life, with this church, and your community. Let me illustrate for you. Imagine being sentenced to prison, and at the final hearing, the judge pardons you. That's forgiveness. That's what we think grace is. It's just the pardon. You're good to go. All right, you're free to go. But no, the judge doesn't stop there. Not only are you pardoned, the judge sets you up with a home, a community that loves you, and a new job or calling that you absolutely love. And he still does not job, stop there. The judge says, you know what? I'm going to spend the rest of my life fathering you and helping you do life with wisdom, joy, and kindness with every single person you meet. And I'm going to show you how to keep loving yourself better and better each day. Imagine a God that responds to us that way. It doesn't, it's not just about forgiveness, guys. There's a full life that comes with grace. That's what Paul is saying. Let's finish reading. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I have to emphasize this point again. What Paul is saying here, grace doesn't exist simply because sin exists. So can we just please get our heads out of that? Grace does not exist because sin exists. Paul is saying that the law intensifies the sin. Religion intensifies the sin. This tyranny of shoulds intensifies sin. And when it's sin versus the law, sin has the upper hand. But when it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down every single time. Let that sink in. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down every single time. I know a lot of you might be thinking, well, wait, hold up, hold up. Does this passage condone sin? Does this mean there's no place for justice? Absolutely not. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace isn't opposed to justice. Grace isn't opposed to us meaningfully trying to grow as a human being and as a follower of Jesus. What Paul is saying is that there is no sin, no human condition that will ever be an exception to his grace. Does that make sense? Paul's not condoning sin here. God does not condone sin. What he's saying is that there's no sin, 
no human condition, no dark moment in your life or in your community that is not an exception to God's grace. Period. Period. There's no exception. Period. And I'll leave you with this insight. And I hope this challenges you and makes you uncomfortable. God's response to sin and its consequences is always, always grace for everybody involved. And I know that is hard to hear, especially when that person has broken your trust, especially when you might feel like you're the victim, especially when you feel like things are out of control and you don't know what's next and there's uncertainty in the unknown. But remember, there is grace knocking at the door. So, I'm really excited to share with you guys what's next. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal story of grace. And I think it really embodies Paul's message about grace and what grace does for us. You guys ready for this? In December of 2016, over 4,000 veterans traveled to Standing Rock in North Dakota to support water protectors against the Dakota Access Pipeline, a corporate project that, if approved, would run through 1,100 miles of sacred land, an oil pipeline. The North Dakota governor threatened to cut off supplies and forcibly evacuate indigenous people who were trying to protect their burial grounds, their land, and their water supply. During the first major blizzard of the season, many veterans showed up and spoke out against the violence, the racism, and the injustice directed at the Lakota people, the Cheyenne people, and the Sioux. And I want to focus on one particular man, Wesley Clark Jr. Army veteran Wesley Clark Jr. was one of these veterans who showed up. A new Christian, Wesley Clark Jr. served as a first lieutenant in the 7th Calgary, Calvary, in addition to supporting the water protectors, Clark Jr. had another reason for visiting Standing Rock that December. He wanted to ask for forgiveness for the atrocities committed by the armed forces of the United States military. Because over a couple centuries of colonization, the U.S. military had, and arguably so has been, responsible for decades of intergenerational trauma against indigenous people groups. So Clark Jr. wanted to ask Lakota people to host a forgiveness ceremony on their sacred grounds. On December 5th, 2016, Clark Jr., along with a dozen members of the US military branches got down on bended knee to beg forgiveness from the Lakota people in the presence of hundreds of veterans and Lakota people, elders and leaders, Clark Jr. asked for forgiveness on behalf of the United States military. With tears in his eyes, Clark read this letter. And I post this to you here. Many of us, me particularly, are from the units that have hurt you over the many years. We came, we fought you, we took your land, we signed treaties that we broke. We stole minerals from your sacred hills. We blasted the faces of our presidents onto your sacred mountain. Then we took still more land, and then we took your children, and then we tried to eliminate the language that God gave you and the creator gave you. We didn't respect you. We polluted your earth. We've hurt you in so many ways, but we've come to say that we are sorry. We are at your service, and we beg for your forgiveness. Wow. Soon afterwards, a Lakota chief held his hand over Clark Jr.'s head and forgave the officers kneeling before him. Many veterans in the room cried during the ceremony, acknowledging the long history of warfare against the indigenous people seeking to protect their homelands in the midst of this Dakota Access Pipeline project. Wow. Worship team, if you can come up. God spoke to Wesley Clark Jr. 
and through courageous act of seeking forgiveness, not only did forgiveness come, but the fullness of life, new life for those present in the room. Even more so, there's a story of a woman named Phyllis. She was one of the Lakota leaders. She offered to adopt Wesley Clark Jr. into the family through a sacred ceremony. How powerful is that? Guys, the last lesson here, the big picture is this. God is making everything new through his grace. God is making everything new through his grace. Yes, sin has consequences, and we can respond with a strong arm of justice, with punitive measures, and, and a lot of those things, and those, that response is legitimate. I'm not minimizing that. We can also choose to ignore the sin and the consequences and step away. But I love what God's doing. He's doing something new. A couple weeks ago, I was in Colorado Springs at a vineyard kind of leaders meeting with pastors. And during a special session um, uh, for our Southeast Asia, or for our Asia region that the, the Arcos Vineyard is involved in, um, uh, there was a man that gave a word over our coast community. The word was this. He said that the coast community is like a big vessel, a clay pot. That pot fell over and crashed, and all the broken fragments of clay scattered. It was in different places. And he said that God wants to bring all of those little fragments back together into a new mosaic. And what was important was he was saying, it's not going to look the same as it was before. It's never going to go back to the way it was. And I don't think God's even interested in bringing things back to the way it was. But what God is doing is that he's building a new mosaic from the broken fragments. A new mosaic. And I asked him, well, how, what does that mean? How, what does that look like? What are you supposed to do? And he said four words to me. And I think this is the call for our church today. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. So we're going to worship, and then we're going to have a time of just prayer and receiving the Holy Spirit. I was getting a, a sense from the Holy Spirit that simply put, He wants you to receive Him today. And the invitation for prayer this morning is if you're new at Coast, whatever stage of life that you're in, whatever emotions and thoughts that you have in some of the darkest moments of your life. I think some of you need a reminder that Christ died for us and he loves us at our darkest moments and he's with us in that. For others of you, you're wondering what the next step looks like. You're wondering what this new season, what is this new wine that he is bringing out? And I just want, I encourage you to come up and receive the Holy Spirit. You're more than welcome to come up here and just kneel or sit and just receive the Holy Spirit. And people are going to come around you, just pray for you. You don't have to say anything. We just want to pray over you and bless you. Receive the Holy Spirit. All right, let's all stand up and hold hands. We do this at the end of every service. Maybe as a reminder that we are a mosaic <laughs> of broken but beautiful fragments. Father, we love you. You're making something new from all these different fragments and pieces. You're making new wine out of all of us. I bless each person in this room with the Holy Spirit, a double portion of the Holy Spirit, that you know that you hear the voice of God. The sheep knows the shepherd's voice. That you listen to it and you chase it at all costs and you obey it at all costs because it's going to produce so much life for you and those around you. That the way we respond to sin is with an overwhelming sense of grace and commitment to grace as a church. So I bless each of you to be agents of grace in your communities, in your line of work, in your spheres of influence, with your kids with your spouses, with your families, with your roommates, with your clients. I bless you in the name of Jesus with the Holy Spirit. In your name, amen.
So we're going to keep worshiping. Come on up. Receive the Holy Spirit. Feel free to just sit or kneel if you need to.